Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. If you're looking for a pet boa constrictor, there are lots and lots of great choices out there, like this VPIT positive albino. But there's also a few really bad choices. Today I'm going to count down my list of the worst pet boas. And these are all snakes I think you should avoid if you want to have a positive experience as a boa keeper. If you find this video helpful and want to learn all about keeping and breeding boa constrictors in captivity, as well as seeing lots of these beautiful animals, please be sure to subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any, any of my upcoming boa videos. First of all, I wanted to say that the majority of animals available as pets in the boa world can make really excellent pets. And I've done quite a few videos going over the best pet boas and the best boas for beginners and you know, my favorite boas, things like that. So what I'm gonna talk about today, this is the small minority of situations. And so what prompted me to do this video is I often see uh, or hear stories online about people that are in a certain situation. And so they got into this situation with a boa and they didn't really understand what they were getting into or why it was not a good boa for them. And it turned out to be a disaster. So hopefully if you watch this video, I want you to be able to avoid the same types of situations so you don't end up with a really terrible experience with your pet boa. The first boa that you should avoid at all costs is any morph that has health problems. And so I love morph boas. I know that there's kind of this morph versus locality rivalry thing going on that I don't really understand. I love both the morph and the locality boas and I have great examples of each of them that are perfectly healthy and that make great pets. But there are some morphs which are associated with health problems. And the first group I wanna talk about are the incomplete dominant supermorphs. So what exactly does this mean? Well, incomplete dominant genes, which are often referred to as co-dominant genes, are genes that have a phenotype or a visual effect when they're present as one copy in a boa. So an example is the jungle gene. So this is a jungle and it has one copy of the jungle gene and it has the aberrancies of the pattern and the coloration that's associated with the jungle gene. But if this animal were to have two copies, if it was homozygous for the jungle gene, it would be called a super jungle. And so the super jungle morph is somewhat controversial. Many people claim that they do have health problems. They will often not live very long. They might live for a few years and then not be very healthy and then end up dying. Other people claim that super jungles are able to reach adulthood, but they're not able to reproduce. While other people claim that the reason they haven't reproduced is not because they can't, but just because it hasn't been demonstrated yet. So. I don't know what the truth is. I've never actually had a super jungle. I've only had a jungle boa like this one. But you might want to think twice about picking up a super jungle boa, especially if you intend to breed it. There's a few other types of, of super morphs that are known to be not very healthy. Um, the most uh, commonly discussed is the super motley. So the motley gene encodes this pattern that has these circles going down the back of the animal. And that's when it's present as one copy in the uh, heterozygous form. But when you have two copies of the motley gene in an animal, it's a lethal mutation. And these animals don't last very long. So um, the super motleys will typically have this really dark black appearance. But most people report that they end up dying within a few months up to maybe a year or two at the most. So um, it seems pretty likely that super motley is not a healthy morph. And you know, I'm saying pretty likely because a lot of this is just based on keepers experiences on the internet. And there's not a lot that's set in stone at this point. There's a few other incomplete dominant super morphs which have been reported to have health problems. And these include the Aztec and the Arabesque boas and both of these morphs affect the pattern but the uh, super Aztecs have been reported to have some central nervous system issues, including lack of coordination. The super arabesque has been reported to have a similar uh, type of thing as the super jungle with animals not being very healthy and not really typically uh, living for very long. The super Moran boas is an, another unknown. These animals appear to be healthy, but there's some questions about if they can reproduce, although this might just be because there's so few of these animals around, it hasn't been demonstrated yet. 
And then lastly, I want to say that the Super Hypo, which is one of the most common incomplete dominant supers, appears to be healthy. So you don't have to worry about the Super Hypo. But any of the other animals, I would think twice about purchasing these animals. And you also want to think twice if you're a breeder about producing these animals. The second type of worst pet boa that I want to discuss are other types of morphs that are not incomplete dominant. And this is a call albino boa. And I wanted to say that this animal is not an animal that's a worse pet boa. This is actually a really good pet boa. And call albinos and other albinos can be great pet boas. The reason I brought this animal out is that he illustrates some of the issues that were once present in the boa breeding and still are present to some extent. And when albinos first came out, they were really rare and people wanted to produce lots of them. And so they ended up doing a lot of inbreeding to perpetuate the morph. And so a lot of animals were born with deformities, including lack of an eye. They'd be born either with just one eye or with no eyes, which at the time it was thought it was, might be due to the albino gene itself. But now it appears more that it's a result of inbreeding. So not the albino gene per se, but because the animals were so inbred to perpetuate the albino gene, they ended up having lack of eyes and other deformities. But if they're properly outbred and new genetic stock is introduced, this isn't as much of an issue. And in fact, when these animals first became available, people were strongly advised not to breed an albino with an albino. You breed it with a non-albino, get some fresh genes in there, and you don't have the issues. Now it appears to be okay to breed albinos to albinos, provided that they're not too closely related. So you want to avoid uh, morphs that are really inbred and that have these genetic problems. Um, there's also morphs where the gene itself is the issue. It's not just the inbreeding, but the gene is associated with certain defects. Um, one of them is the scoria gene. And scoria is a rather mysterious looking boa, or a mysterious boa. They're very, very striking. I'd, you know, I'd love to have a scoria in my collection. Um, they're a very unique boa with mostly patternless, uh, kind of a tannish pink, but then it's got these dark splotches of the normal pattern, really standout looking boa. Unfortunately, it appears they do have some central nervous system effects. Some of the animals have a head wobble, you know, the, the head doesn't really hold up and stand still, it kind of wobbles, kind of like the spider mutation in ball pythons. And some of them have it worse than others. Some do, apparently don't have it at all, maybe this is something that could be bred out, but you know, if this is a, a characteristic that's inherent to the gene, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to be bred out. So before you buy a morph, especially an expensive morph like a scoria, make sure you understand the potential for genetic defects associated both with the gene itself, as well as with, you know, you want an animal that's not inbred uh, that could introduce some problems. Third on my list of worst pet boas are wild-caught animals. And a few decades ago, there was a lot less captive breeding going on. And so there were a lot more wild-caught animals on the market. And people were strongly advised to find captive-born animals whenever possible, just because they did so much better in captivity. And today with boas, the vast majority on the market are born in captivity. Virtually all the morph boas, of course, are born in captivity. And most of the locality boas as well, because a lot of the countries where they're exported from have closed to export. But there still remain some wild caught animals. And the most commonly seen are the true red tail boas, boa constrictor, constrictor, like the Suriname boa. And so a lot of people get into boas and they're just struck by the beauty of these red tail boas. And they are among the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful snake that is available. But then they see the price tags and they realize that they're out of their budget. So they might see babies for sale in the you know, $600 to $1,000 range for a nice captive bred, you know, high quality true red tail boa. But then they see a wild caught animals that are available often for less than half that. And so they figure they'll buy the wild caught animal and they'll do their homework and they'll acclimate it and you know they'll save the money that way. Well there's a couple of things wrong with this. The problem is is that these wild caught animals can be hard even for seasoned boa keepers to acclimate. And you know despite all of the efforts when people import uh, wild caught animals even 
people with experience, a lot of them end up not making it. If you do pick up a wild caught boa, you're going to have to go to the vet to get it deparasitized at a bare minimum. And even that single vet visit can set you back a few hundred dollars. So right there is all the money that you could have spent and just bought the captive bred animal. In addition, when you buy a captive bred animal from a reputable breeder, you'll get the assistance of that breeder and you know the help to make sure that the animal is well acclimated. When you buy a, a wild caught animal, this is typically an animal that's been exported. It's been under a lot of stress. You know, sometimes they are given some deparasitization like flagell or something, or you know, external ticks are removed. But I've heard stories about animals, wild caught animals that still have ticks and other ectoparasites attached to them. So, um, you know, buying a wild caught animal doesn't really save you the money because you're going to spend a lot more on the medical and the vet care to get it acclimated. And then there's still a very good chance it's not going to make it. So you're going to go through all this effort and the animal is just going to end up dying. And, you know, you're going to have the emotional you know, involvement of having to go through that experience. So I strongly, strongly urge you, if you're a first time boa keeper, well, first of all, you probably shouldn't get a true red tail to begin with. But if you do, do not get a wild caught one. You know, spend the extra money, get a captive bred one from a reputable breeder. Trust me, it's going to be worth it for you. As far as wild caught animals, I would say that the only people who should be considering these are breeders who want to get new bloodlines to diversify the genetics of their collection. Um, the vast majority of the animals that I have are captive bred. I have a few animals which are farm bred from Peru, some Peruvian red tails. And they've done pretty well for me, but I've also heard about people that have bought similar farm bred Peruvian boas and they end up dying, you know, in just a few months. Next on the list of worst pet boas are baby boas that are not properly acclimated. And so this is a crawl key boa. This guy, as you may know, was born in my collection about a month ago. And so I'm getting these animals acclimated before they're ready to go to their new homes. So. I've been pretty lucky. Most of them have eaten, no problem. This guy has actually had three meals and I'll probably feed him another, you know, one or two times before he'll be ready to ship to his new home. But when you're buying a locality boa, especially some of the island boas that can be really hard to get to eat as babies, make sure you ask the breeder if, he's, if the animal's feeding and what it's feeding on. And if the breeder has an, a litter that's born and then the next week they want to sell it, without doing the proper work to get them acclimated, you wanna avoid these types of breeders at all costs. Okay, because it's, it, sometimes it's not trivial to get animals to eat. It can take, in some cases, many months and they might need to be assist fed or the breeder might need to uh, try different tricks to get them feeding. And this is not something that a beginner who wants a pet boa should be expected to do. So ask about the feeding history only, uh, buy a boa, which is properly feeding, and then understand what you're gonna to need to provide. Because in some cases, animals will wanna uh, be eating live mice for the first few months before they go to freeze thawed. So make sure you ask these questions. And if the breeder is not for, uh, forthcoming with the information, you probably should find a new breeder that's gonna be more open about his or her animals. So again, avoid any baby boa that's not feeding and established. So the last type of worst pet boa I want to discuss are certain type of types of rescue boas. And this is actually a uh, boa constrictor longicata, the long tail boa. This is not a rescue boa. This is just a nice boa for you to look at while I'm talking. So often I've heard these stories about people that go to pet shops that are not reputable pet shops and they have these um, boas in very poor health. Often the animals have several layers of skin stuck to them. They look like they haven't been fed lately. They might be infested with mites. They're in a cage, which is completely inappropriate. You know, there might be AstroTurf as a substrate with a heat rock and a dish of dirty water that has a lot of feces floating in it. I'm sure you've seen the horrible pictures that get posted online. So people will see animals in these deplorable conditions and they feel really bad for the animal and they want to rescue it. and. You know, while I completely understand the sentiment, you know, I really feel bad for these animals also. Unfortunately, when you rescue these types of animals by buying them, 
it doesn't really solve the problem. And unfortunately, what that does is that now the pet shop owner has sold the animal, so they're going to go out and get another animal to put in that place. And the only way that this is going to stop is if people stop buying these types of animals. And, you know, there are other ways you can put pressure on these types of, you know, fly-by-night organizations. So I would highly recommend not to buy these animals because it's not going to solve the problem. And then when you get the animal home, there's other issues. So you might need to spend a lot of money and uh, effort and energy on caring for the animal, going to the vet, things like that. The animal might have diseases which could spread to your other snakes if you have other snakes. You know, at the minimum, there could be mites in the animal or there could be inclusion body disease or respiratory infections. Um, so you don't want to put your other animals at risk by bringing home this rescue boa. So, I mean, I know it's a heartbreaking situation. I don't know what the answer is, but the answer is not to try to rescue these boas by buying them from these fly-by-night establishments. So I think it's definitely a good idea to rescue a boa when possible because there are quite a few unwanted boas that need homes. It's you know not unlike all of the unwanted and excess dogs and cats that get, get put into humane societies and animal shelters that desperately need homes. But there are a lot of humane societies that do have uh, boas and other reptiles. Even your local humane society that has mostly dogs and cats might occasionally have boas and other reptiles. And typically these are animals that are surrendered by the owners because they change uh, living situations or the animal gets too big or for some other reason they can't care for them anymore. And these are animals that are typically in really good health. And sometimes the um, humane societies will even provide vet uh, treatment and if they don't have a reptile vet, they might provide you with assistance so that you can go and have your animal checked out by a vet. So I would say if you want to rescue an animal, a boa, it's a great thing, but go to your local humane society or your other you know, types of animal shelters that do have these boas that need homes. So that's my list of the worst pet boas. And I would strongly recommend that you avoid these animals at all costs in order to have a positive boa keeping experience. As I said before, I've done a lot of videos on great pet boas, including a video entitled Best Pet Boas. So I would strongly urge that you go check that one out right now if you haven't already to get an idea about boas that make great pets. I hope this video was helpful. As always, let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.